Hey everybody, Connie Knox, a lifelong genealogist, helping you go further, faster, factually with your family research. Coming up next is part three of the three-part series about the U.S. federal census. So, enjoy part three. So as we go back in time, there are tricks to learning how to uh, do research prior to 1850. So if you can't, if, if you've done the research, like, you know, you've 1900, 1880, 1870, whatnot, and you're going back and now all of a sudden before 1850, they're only listing the head of household. How do you... How do you find your family and confirm that that's them? There's some tricks and I'm going to show you how to do that. So in the early census records, 1790 to 1830, well actually 1840, um, you can do this trick. Um, but these early census records um, were taken on pretty much any piece of paper. There was really no forms. We talked about that before. The head of household uh, was only listed and there are no schedules to exist. Uh, for Delaware, Georgia, Kentucky, New Jersey, Tennessee, and Virginia, apparently these were destroyed during the British attack on Washington during the War of 1812. And yes, I actually lifted that entire little paragraph off of archives.com, excuse me, archives.gov. And um, I just felt it was important to point out. So the keep in mind that the very early census schedules were pretty much the Eastern United States. So um, as time goes on, they start at, you know, more and more states become part of the union. And if you think about it, I don't think California was uh, a state until like 1850. So those schedules, those earliest, you wouldn't find in 1800. Uh, census schedule for California, for example. So that I guess that's my point there. Um, all right, so we're going to learn this trick about how to identify a family in an 1840 census. So what we're going to do is we're going to reverse engineer the ages of the family for which you're seeking. In this case, we're going to take Jameson Wesley Booth Sr., he was born in 1820 in Cable County, Virginia, and he died in 1896 in Wayne County, West Virginia. So I've documented this again here, and I'm saying remember to work backwards. In 1890, we know the census was destroyed. We know that he is listed in 1880, 1870, 1860, and 1850. I'm not going to rehash that here, but from that information, we were able to glean information. So... We want to identify a research question. Research questions are really important. You don't want to make your research question too broad. So in this case, we're looking for Jameson Wesley Booth Sr. We know when he was born and we know when he died. We want to find him in the 1840 census. That's reasonable. And most likely he's going to be in the same place that he was either when he died or when he was born somewhere around there. Now, keep in mind that borders change. In this particular case, because uh, West Virginia was not around until 1863, uh, this Cable County, Virginia, where he was born, and Wayne County, West Virginia, are only 35 miles apart because uh, where he died was actually Virginia before he died, if that makes sense. So in 1863, West Virginia becomes a state, and so he actually dies in West Virginia, very close to his birthplace. So this is how we reverse engineer how we're going to find Jameson Wesley Booth Sr. in the 1840 census. But what we're first going to do is we're going to lay out each of the census years that we've already done. We've got 1880, 1870, 1860, 
and 1850. Here he, we have Jameson Wesley Booth. He's the head of household, right? We've got his birth year and his death year listed here. And so in 1880, he's 60 years old. In 1870, he's 49. Now, this is why the month is important because, and quite frankly, he, you know, people were not that into exact how old they were and birth, birth dates and all that. So the fact that he's listed as 49 does not surprise me. He could have actually been 59 in 1880. Um, but usually it's, we kind of factor a plus or minus one or two years. Here he's 39 in 1860. This totally makes sense. Here he's listed as 30 years old in 1850. So it'd be logical that he'd be about 20 years old in 1840. Okay. His wife is listed here, 58, 48, 38, 28. Totally makes sense. She'd probably be about 18 in 1840. They're, now they have 14 children. Um, this this family was busy. The first child died at the age of two, and Jefferson Thomas Thomas Jefferson Booth, their son, was born in 1840. So if we keep in mind, he was born in 1840. Now we're seeking the 1840 census. When we're looking at at the 1840 census, we got to think about when the census taker came by, and was this child born yet? Okay. So if the child was not born yet, he's not going to be listed in the 1840 census, okay? Hester dies in 1840, so she may or may not be listed in the 1840 census. And her brother is born in 1840. He may or may not be listed in the 1840 census. But here's what we do. We lay out what we expect to find. So what I did was I took this spreadsheet. Let me... Bring it back up so you can see it. Took this spreadsheet and I copied it to a new tab. And then I laid in, this is just zoomed back a little bit farther. I laid in that same information. And then I said, okay, Jameson Wesley Booth in 1840 should be about 20 years old. So you put a tick mark here because remember, um, they only label the head of household, but they are going to put the age range in these group buckets. So here we would put a one. Cynthia, his wife, should be about 18 at the time. So under the female section, we put a one under of 15 and under 20 because she should be 18 or 19 years old at the time of the 1840 census. So I'm laying out my expectations of what I want to find. Hester, I have her labeled as she's dead by now, by, you know, 1840, but she might be alive at the time that the census record, at the census, uh, census taker comes around. So we would put, I'm putting a question mark there, um, under five years of age for females. So she may or may not be there. Okay. Now, the last one that we're going to find in the 1840 census is the boy that is born in 1840. And so he would be a question mark. If he's born yet, he would be listed here under the five years of age. So if we go take a look at the actual census record, uh, we find uh, Jameson right here. Now, it's hard to see. Zoom in a little bit. That you see that he's actually, I'm probably zoomed in too far. Uh, Jameson Booth, right there. Okay. And Jameson Booth is in the, in the fifth column here. He is listed in the 20 to 30 bucket. Now that's exactly what we had in our spreadsheet. was uh, that we were expecting him to be there. So this guy is of the right age. He also has... A female under the age of five that matches the girl who later dies that year and then we have his wife listed between 20 and 30 years old Jameson, let me find you again my columns all lined up yep excuse me 15 to 20 years old she should be about 18 at the time of this census so that matches now if you'll notice under Jameson, we don't have the boy. The boy is not born yet. So that's how you reverse engineer 
the expectations of the ages of the persons in the family, and then you go find those that fit. Now, is that absolute proof? It's up to interpretation. I think that's a match. But uh, further information would be helpful. And how you do that is with family. You, uh, If you're not familiar, also Elizabeth Schoen Mills coined the term the fan club. It's also known as cluster genealogy. But you go and you look at the neighbors in the area and you uh, see. And actually what I do is I search 10 pages in each direction. And I document every family member that's in that uh, with the same last name, basically. So if you look down here, you see other um, Booth families. Here's a Thomas Booth. Um, Mrs. Elizabeth Booth living right next door. Um, so the trick there is to identify other persons that you know to be in the family uh, living nearby also helps secure your argument that that person is one and the same persons. I like to go and figure out the expectations first and then go find the record because otherwise I find myself trying to do all that math in my head while I'm looking at the record and am I getting excited about this record or not and so if you do the work ahead of time on a spreadsheet like that then you know exactly what column each person should fall into okay now sometimes remember we have plus or minus a year or two somebody might fall into a different column and then you have a conflict that you need to resolve so again you would use uh, the fan club uh, cluster genealogy to determine whether that family is in fact there now in this case that family is in the right place at the right time in fact they're on the same piece of property so therefore uh, we determined that that he is the right family now how I did that was um, how I found that record specifically and I laid it out here for you and I'm going to show you how to do that because I really like this process this is now I use answer G, but I also use family search um, I use it a lot so uh, I'm going to transition over so that you can see this full screen and I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so you can see it nice and easily so here's how I do this so at ancestry.com I'm a big believer in the card catalog um, I learned this trick from Krista Callan at Ancestry and I follow it religiously uh, I absolutely love this method and uh, it is important for you to learn so here we go to the search and we go to card catalog now and you know at the time that you're watching this video they may have changed the way the menus work but this is the way it's working today so you go to the card catalog and then what I did to find that census is right here at the top and that's probably at the top because it's really important <laughs> so you click on census and voter lists now in this case our research question was about the 1840 census so I am going to choose 1840 and I am also going to drill it down. These are all filters, right? And you can see the filters lining up out here. And I'll zoom in a little bit farther so you can see that well. I'm going to add USA so I don't get all the whole world. And in this case, we are looking for Virginia. So I'm going to scroll down to Virginia and add that to my list. So now you can see we've got census, 1840, US, Virginia and now I'm down to a small list of just four results for those filters and we happen to know that we're looking for the 1840 census so I click on that and now I know that I'm looking for Jameson and because he's already in my family tree uh, I've got him here so I'm just gonna click on that and pull that up and I'm gonna hit search And now because I had already imported it, he's showing up in my imported list. But you could search through here and drill down and try and find him here. I'm going to pull it up for ease. And this shows you the database, right? And then we drill down into the image. And that is how I got to it. That is my method of reverse engineering how you can find someone in the 1840 and actually eight earlier censuses but again work backwards 
and make sure that you are uh, consistently doing the work the same way because once you find them in the 1830 census then you can try and use the same trick on going backwards but in this case Jameson is going to be a child if you go back to the 1830 census so then you would start looking for him as a child and because he was how old was he here he was 20-ish years old he would probably be about 10 uh, in the next census back. So, so I hope you enjoyed that episode uh, about census records. Uh, I know it was a lot of information, but I, hopefully you got something out of it. Uh, I know I did just researching it. It refreshed my memory on some of the details that are available in the different census records. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you are not a subscriber, I hope you consider subscribing at the uh, on the subscribe button down below. Subscribing doesn't hurt, I promise you. There's nothing <laughs> that is going to cost you by subscribing, but it helps me out a bunch. And I'm always trying to, to grow the uh, subscription base and the audience with uh, Genealogy TV. Also, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, I have a Genealogy TV page there, and there's a lot of good conversations going on there some videos going on occasionally and really that is a promotional platform for me to let you know about the next upload for genealogy tv also on youtube if you subscribe ring the bell so that you get notified of the next time we upload if you're not seeing the bell it might be because you might not have created a google account you need to create a google account in order to see the bell so that will allow you to get an email notification of when we upload, which is super helpful. I know a lot of people really enjoy that. So thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time on Genealogy TV. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed that three part series on census records for the US federal census. Uh, leave me some comments below. Let me know if you got anything out of it. What was the takeaway for you? And if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna also put a card up here for you. Don't forget to check out the Tiny Tip Tuesday about the uh, supplemental questions in the census records. I did not talk about that in this series, so make sure you check that out too. Thanks for watching Genealogy TV.